And there we go. All right, from the Beijing to the Dongjing. Today is Friday, September 4th, 2020. My name is Stephen Sersky. Thank you very much for joining me. This is my podcast. Uh, it's episode number 15. And uh, today I have uh, Hiko Simon, who is a Tokyo-based vlogger, uh, podcaster, and he's a, he's, he calls himself a bilingual news geek. Uh, he hosts a live show in, uh, in Japan every Sunday night, 10.30 p.m., Japan Standard Time on YouTube. You can join him. There's a live chat and everything. You can join in on the fun. Uh, he's been in Japan for quite some time, about 16 years or so. Has his own website, hikosimon.com, his own YouTube channel, SoundCloud, you name it. This guy has a lot of stuff going on. And so today it's my pleasure to uh, welcome him to the, uh, to the show. All right, let's check the connecting. There we go. Yes. Finish, admit, he's here. Joining, waiting, connecting. Let's hope this connection doesn't drop. And there we go. Hiko oh. Simon. Yes. Oh, welcome. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice um, to meet you too. <laughs> I introduced you as uh let's see so uh tokyo based vlog v vlogger podcaster bilingual yep. news geek uh you're hosting your own uh live japanese uh japan news show every sunday at 10 30 p.m J uh, japan standard time on youtube uh the yep. the one word that comes to mind when i see what you're doing and this was actually talking about you know doing some research prior to the show uh the one word that strikes me for you is prolific uh how because i have i was trying to create Too a list i'm like oh hands. yeah this guy look at okay i'm gonna name give him one word that's not one word you have a vlog yeah but the vlog has like six channels um you have a website uh each of which has like, well you have a website that has six different like, oh. titles you're on SoundCloud, really? uh, yeah. and you're you're everywhere doing everything. How do you find the time? <laughs> wow, hearing you put it like that, uh, I, I wonder myself. Um, so, uh, I've basically, I think I've only ever set up really two YouTube channels. I've done lots of things on my YouTube channel, um, but honestly, one of those two channels I'll let go dead. Back in the early days, when I really cared about putting really carefully crafted, edited content onto one channel, people would often set up like a beta channel where they'd just put unedited random stuff. And I did that, but then along the lines, like, you know, um, over time when I had a family and everything, I found that this whole live streaming setup, just doing that every week, um, just going on, turning on the camera, talking for an hour, turning it off and your video's already done. Um, it's... Uh, it was easier for my life to do that. So basically my main channel kind of became my junk channel. I just tried to do my, my live stream in a, in a more organized way. So I kind of simplified that. I have done different series and so on, um, which I've put all onto that same channel. Mm -hmm. um, my web page, my blog, I must admit there are, I've, I've let that one kind of go a little bit. Um, again, it's a bit I, 1990s, early little, no. 2000s. Yeah. But yeah, there's I, I a lot on there. there. I mean, I was looking through your best of and it would, if you would, if you were to print it, I would think it'd be about three pages long or something. It's, it's, you have a lot of good posts on there though. And I was going through it. I, I very, I, I enjoyed the, um, the whole fluency argument that you had about when, when are you fluent in a language? Um, and I'm going to guess that oh, your, wow. your upper thirties, maybe forties, because those blog posts mm. sound like a young man who has, yeah is learning a language, has learned a language, but yeah. constantly faces that question of like, well, can you speak it? What about in this situation? What about in this? Oh, then you actually don't know the language, do you? And you're going, well, but do you know the language if you're put yeah. in that same situation? I love that stuff. I was like, yep, huh. I hear this guy. I love that you found that. Like, I think this is uh, back in a time when I had some more time to write that. I guess the other thing that's really changed and part of the reason I don't blog so much now, although there was an overlap period, was um, that was pre-Twitter. So pre-Twitter, you would read some news and think something was interesting and get an idea in my head and I'd go and write it free form in a blog. Yeah. Um, whereas nowadays, I've got RSS news feeds and conversations on Twitter and it's definitely not as great a, a form of human communication, but you cover a lot more ground and what my live stream is is summarizing that. So I've kind of boiled everything down to Twitter and um, 
and YouTube now. But I must admit, I miss the long form. I mean, it takes time to do, but I actually, uh, and now that you mentioned that, I remember writing that. It was a long time ago. I think when I wrote that, I was at the stage where I was pretty comfortably fluent by that point. I'd been here more than 10 years and I'd worked in Japanese companies and spoken nothing but Japanese all my life for a long oh, wow. period of time. But it was funny. I was watching other people online and in different places and conversations sort of debate, you know, like that. I'd always get the question, how long did you take to become fluent? I, I, get, I get that question a lot from people well, asking. I was going to ask you, you actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote the blog. I wrote that blog because I got that question from so many people. And what I was trying to explain is that it's like, um, you know, when did you become a fully formed human? Um, <laughs> you know, you kind of, uh, you know, you, you, you get, full, you grow fast in some periods, but you never really stop, right? You're always right. sort of adding to it uh, with life experience. Uh, and that's true of fluency as well. Fluency is just a reflect. I mean, when did you, uh, that's right. I think I wrote, I'm remembering now. When did you become fluent in your own language? We all assume that we're fluent, like, uh, since we're kids, but actually, Kids have limited vocabulary. We, you know, we, yeah. we survive through the world with limited vocabulary as kids that we just expand through life based on what we need. And it's the same with language, right? So, you know, you can be, I mean, I would not be fluent in an accountancy firm. If I went to an accounting firm and tried to talk with the accountants about their jobs, I wouldn't be fluent in that conversation. And it was funny when I first came to Japan, I was at an IT company where I could barely still, you know, do forms at the city council office, but I could talk about uh, designing a program flow in Japanese <laughs> because it was what I was talking about every day. I learned the words. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a funny thing. It's not as simple. People who don't speak other languages just assume that, you know, one day you, you know, you know, the pill, oh, I can speak Japanese. Uh, it's not like the Matrix. Uh, you know, I love that, but people kind of assume it's like a switch and it's absolutely not. And people don't realize that with your own native language, it's not uh, simple either. So yeah, I thought that was an interesting, well, I'm, that's cool. I'm really happy that you found that old blog. I, I should read it myself. With that, uh, the fluency argument, and I get this with Chinese, and I see it with Chinese, because one of the big problems that I have learning Mandarin is that yeah. I have to qualify it with people that I, I go back to Canada, and I, I and they right. say, well, what's that say? I'm like, uh, I actually, I can't read that because that's traditional Chinese, and I'm oh, studying yeah. simplified Mandarin Chinese. That's how Taiwanese people troll mainland people, right? I, they <laughs> Well, it's, and like, they put up the traditional characters. Yeah, and you go to Sh if I go to Shanghai and I try to speak to them, they're yeah. like, oh, "No, we could speak English because your Chinese is very good." I'm like, "Okay, but yeah, trying, <laughs> right?" Same with oh, even yeah. going down to Hong Kong, they all speak English. They'll they, uh, if I speak Putonghua, like Mandarin Chinese, to them, I actually get treated worse than if I were to just speak English. There, there's that dichotomy, oh. and that has to do with their history. Um, yeah. But it's, I mean, it is my choice to learn Mandarin, and I'm going to continue learning Mandarin. Uh, but I, one of the things, like for fluency, I was one of the, when I would consider myself to be fluent in quotation marks, is if someone were to give me a piece of um, Chinese writing, Mandarin right Chinese writing, and I would be able to go, I might not know all of what this says, but I could figure yeah. it out. Right. Yeah. So that, that to me, I'd be well, like, okay, I'm, I'm basically fluent. Yeah. Which is what kids do. Like in English, if you give them a newspaper and they read like the business pages, they'll, they'll skip over the words and put it together what they think it is, you know, based on that's what we do ourselves in our own native language. It's not, it's not like you're doing such a different thing. We're like kids in a foreign language sort of growing. Um, but much respect on the Chinese, by the way. I, I, I took a few, I took some weekend classes on Chinese, but the, the, the tonal languages and Japanese is a little bit tonal, but it's not nothing like the degree of Chinese. But China, but wow. uh, Japanese, oh, because I was trying to, uh, I was supposed to go to Japan uh, again for the yeah. second time back in February. And I, I had this, mm -hmm. this idea that I was going to learn Japanese in six weeks. Uh, yeah. it, I think I had the same idea with Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work, um, and but within six weeks, because within six weeks, I was using a few apps uh, to study, yeah. and I was like, okay, I've Chinese isn't my first language that I've studied. I've studied a few languages, and so I'm, I know the, uh, the idea of how to study a language, and I, I can do this. I know that. I know how to break it down, time myself, you know, uh, uh, proportion my day, especially with COVID, when there was a work yeah. stoppage. Well, in January, uh, we had Spring Festival here in China. D do you guys celebrate that in Japan as well? Do you, do you have like um, a long weekend or like long week off or anything like that? Yeah. Uh, so when you say Spring Festival, so that would be during 
the same period as Golden Week in Japan, probably. So yeah, we have equivalents at the same like time. Like the, of the, year, the Lunar so, yeah. New Year sort of thing? We don't have the Lunar New Year. The, the Japan used to have the, the Lunar New Year. They call it the Old New Year because Japan used to celebrate Chinese New Year, but then they right. switched to the Western calendar. And they, yeah. but, so they, but, but we have a similar vacation to that that happens in May. So oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. We, we, don't, we don't have a break exactly on that, but we get lots of Chinese tourists during that time. Well, of course, because it's, it's easy. Yeah. And Ch Chinese people love Japan and Japanese culture. It, but, yeah, it's, I, I know it's complicated, but yeah, it, it, I, I, do, I do like to see when things are going well. So yeah. Uh, um, just to finish the, uh, the language uh, portion uh, point was that with uh, mm. Japanese, uh, you were speaking about the tones of Mandarin with Japanese, at least with Chinese, when you read a character, it is a character, it is pronounced the same yeah. way no matter what. But Japanese, right. I, I hit the wall when it became... Yeah. The, you read the sentence. Three different possibilities. And there, yeah. yeah, and it's not even like the honorific system. Forget that. It's the oh, yeah. watashi became something different or like there's different uh, the prepositions or the, um, what do you call those things that mm. point towards a place? Uh, adverbs, yeah. uh, pronouns and stuff like that. They all change yeah. in a sense. It's like, nope, done, give up, tap, six okay. weeks, not possible, I tap out, I, I'm done. Yeah. No, Japanese is fine. It, well, it's a little bit, it, it, yeah, it, it, that is the advantage. Chinese has more characters, but they all have like singular readings, whereas in Japanese, they have multiple ancient Chinese readings, which if you use them in compound words, uh, will use one of those multiple possibility of Chinese readings that you have to just wrote, memorize, or it'll have a Japanese reading if you use it in isolation. So watashi is a Japanese word. So if you have an isolation, just literally meaning I, it'll be watashi. But if they say something like private, this is private property. You know, it'll be uh, shiritsu. You know, they'll, they'll say shi, which sounds right. kind of Chinese. I mean, but I remember when I was learning Chinese, my, my impression was, um, apart from the fact that the you ha I had to focus so hard to do the e, 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 e. Yeah. But the other thing was, there are so many sounds that, are, like, again, apart from the, in English, we were basically, we are tone deaf as English speakers, right? We're not, we don't, we're not raised noticing those differences. So we're not, our ears are not trained for it. So I don't know how you develop those muscles because for me, even in Japanese, in Japanese, meaning will change based on time. Yeah. But I kind of wing it, honestly. I've been here for 22 years. Um, so I can kind of, I say it the way I always hear it. It's kind of become muscle memory, but I'm not conscious about, I'm not consciously controlling the tone that I'm using. I'm kind yeah. of just saying, and sometimes people will say, why did you say hashi? It's hashi. I'm oh, geez, sorry. I, I said hashi instead of hashi. <laughs> and but to I, me, I I'm going, it's the myself. same word. <laughs> well, exactly. So, you know, I remember concentrating so hard with the Chinese tones, but the other thing was you have S I and J I and X I and Z H I and J H I. Yeah. And I remember practicing in my weekend Chinese classes and one day I was focusing so hard. And, and, but when I just lost concentration for a second, it all just became zhu, 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 yep. zhu, zhu, zhu. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> it's, I, I know exactly what you're talking about because with those, when I hear, you can tell when someone has just started studying Chinese, you pick up on mm -hmm. those consonants, those consonant clusters that you just talked about. And I'm like, yep, you don't have it yet. Yeah. But even with focus. that, the the xi and the sh, those ones yeah. become very similar, and that's like be, between like North China to South China. It, it's only like a three-hour yeah. high-speed train ride from like Beijing to the mm. next city, uh, like uh, Taiyuan, or if you go to a place like Xi'an, would have it. Any of those cities along the same parallel as um, Shanghai, they they change mm. the x i to an s h. So is it sh wow. or is it xi? So it could be 10 or four. And that's yeah. where you kind of go, okay, I don't know. But as long, that's sort of like intri yeah. in, it within China itself, but that the jia, the, the zhe, that takes some practice. I, I know I, I get it mixed up too yeah. still. Yeah, uh, no, so much respect uh, at being able to do that. It, and I must admit as a party trick, I mean, it's, I'm sure you've found <laughs> this as well. It's always, it, it's, it's a nice party trick to, to when people say, you must get there. You go back to Canada, say something in Chinese, say something in Japanese, show me, show me. And it's kind of like, they put you on the spot a little bit. And when I go to America um, with my coworkers on work trips or whatever, and I'll, I'll, you know, and I'll be speaking to them, people go, wow, it's a white person speaking Asian language. But, you know, I lived <laughs> here for 22 years, right? Yeah. You know, it's sort of, but at the same time, I must admit, even to me, like Japanese as a spoken language, to be honest, um, there are difficulty. There are things that are difficult about Japanese. 
as you said, the reading system is a, is a, is a mess. A lot like English is, it's like with English, we borrowed words simultaneously from Greek and German and, you know, we, we don't pronounce K's and we, we, we have a horrible um, male form language, which had got the printing press at the wrong time before it was settled. So we have the same problem in English, but Japanese, they've got the similar problem that they just borrowed from so many places and they never settled anything before they decided to lock it all in. Yeah. Um, so that's hard and, and honorific system and stuff like that. The fact you have to use totally different languages based on your situation, based on your position in the room and who else is in the room. And if someone leaves the room, then you have to switch again. Uh, that's, that, that's a pain. <laughs> Um, do, but, do you does but, that ever get do, does you do you get confused with that because you're not you're not an English teacher I'm basically an English teacher so yeah, like yeah. my my honorific system basically hits a certain level yeah. <laughs> it doesn't go any higher than like principal there's if I met a boss usually they're yeah. more like nervous about me than yeah. me than me being nervous about them because I'm like obviously I'm here to speak English not. Chinese, yeah. right? So, but does that ever get confusing to you, or do you ever mess it up in like any serious way? Oh, well, here's the thing: Japanese people mess it up. So this is the thing. Ja I mean, dirty secret. <laughs> yeah. Well, well. So frankly, like, so what shocked me was I, I learned Japanese a little bit at university, and they taught us about this. So I had a basic grasp of business Japanese before I came to Japan as a new graduate. So when I was joined a Japanese company as the only non-Japanese with a hundred co-hires. Um, and we were doing business Japanese. We were doing business Japanese language classes as part of new hire orientation at this company that I was at. And when they were saying like, so when you're leaving a company before other people, what do you say? And all, all my university graduate, like elite university grad coworkers, um, got the wrong answer. And I'm like, how could you get that answer wrong? I mean, even wow, watching yeah. TV, you must be able to pick it up, but, but they don't know. And the point is they learn it the same way I did. You, you make the mistake and you get hazed by your boss for doing it and you just get it beaten into you. Yeah. Um, but there are so many, so many of these rules and the idea that, for example, so you'd think the safest thing is just to be polite all the time. Um, so the biggest mistake and the hardest thing to do is, if I'm talking, you can be kind of neutrally polite. You know, you can, you can exaggerate. If you exaggerate, then it's kind of careful because you don't want to over, you know, overdo it in the wrong place. But you can be kind of neutral, polite to everybody. And that would work. That A lot of foreigners, that's what we do. But like when, when you're with a, like if I'm talking to you and we're in the same company, I might say, I might call you son just because, you know, um, we're, we're not close friends, but we work right. together and we, I want to be friendly. But the moment a customer comes into the room, um, I basically, you become my homie. Okay. And when I talk about my homies, um, I have to say sung. I have to say polite, you know, say, say politely to this guy. But if I'm saying politely to this guy, it's like I'm telling the customer you have to bow to him or something. Like it's kind of, it's really rude to describe someone from your own team to someone from a different team in an honorific way. Well, you have to speak humbly about your own team. So I basically have to use language, which I would use if I was speaking down, even if he's my boss. I have to like cut off the sun. I'm not allowed to use sun with my own team. And it's really, it throws you because you just have this rule that, okay, people like call everyone sun. But if I call someone on my own team, sun, when someone from a different team is around, I'm being really rude all of a sudden, even though five seconds before he came, before when he, when the customer wasn't in the room, that's what I had to say. And you switch that up and you add alcohol to it and you know, and you get hazed. <laughs> um, it's pretty harsh. And so but the point I was about to get is those things are hard, but, but okay. Japanese fundamentally, is an easy language. And that's what I told my colleague. I'm like, it's so much easier to read. I mean, you can have fun reading it. I mean, I thought it was easy and then the, the pronunciation became a problem. The, the reading part is hard, but well, well, the pronunciation is the easy part. This is the thing. Um, it's got one of the narrowest ranges of vowels and voice sounds. It's all done in the throat. They don't use the mouth. You can speak Japanese coherently while biting down on a pencil. Um, you know, it's basically... Everything is linked to only one of only five vowels. I've only got five vowel sounds. Right. We've got a really limited range, which is why it's so hard for Japanese to pick up other languages because they can't, they don't have the muscles to make the sounds like with their faces. Yeah. Um, but, but coming in, everybody has the muscles in their faces and their mouths to speak Japanese because it's so limited. There's only like two grammar tenses. There's only two types of verbs. There's no, um, there's no future tense. There's only past and present. Um, it's like Indonesian, you know, in terms of the simplicity of the grammar and simplicity of the pronunciation. And if you just learn in like the middle level of politeness, which is the easiest way to teach it, it's not hard at all. It's just that they, um, they mess it up by making it more complicated. One with the politeness culture and, uh, you know, the, the moving politeness culture and, and oh, two with wow. the half 
asked way that they imported Chinese. Um, those are the things that make it really hard. Oh, yeah. You know. But if you just want to speak, um, if you want to focus on coming in, and, uh, there's a lot of people who are getting a girlfriend um, yeah. and, and picking up that way. Yeah, you can you can get pretty fluent pretty fast. It's actually not very complicated. Yeah, you can do that with any language. I mean, getting girlfriend True. material because, but at that level though, to, to be honest, and I've seen this happen in, in mm. a lot of countries that I've traveled to, um, is that when you reach that level of like girlfriend getting, uh, yeah. you, you sort of hit a ceiling of your own language but then you also yeah. have to realize that it might not be a fair relationship in the sense that she... Oh, that's a complicated, yeah. Yeah, she will probably maybe be using you, at least for the first little while, <laughs> as an English learning partner, exchange partner, right? But, I mean, it's not to say that things can't go further and you find that there's common interest and, you know, like, oh, you both like to travel, you both have an interest of, like, building a family together. But when you only reach that that dating material of, of language, you really hit a ceiling very quickly. Because if you don't have any depth behind it, there's no. like you're not talking to the really interesting people. There is a funny thing with Japanese, by the way, as well, um, that um, uh, the the way that the the words, the vocabulary, um, there, there are there are female words and male words in Japanese. It might be the same in Chinese. No. So there is a okay. Well, there is in Japanese. <laughs> the way that you say "I," the words that you select for certain um, common expressions are different between women and men. Yeah. Um, and so, if you learn by imitation from your girlfriend, <laughs> uh, you're gonna you're gonna give a certain impression. Which actually, uh, it's kind of funny. There is there, there's a, there's a Roppongi. There's a part of Tokyo where 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 white guys go looking for Japanese girls, and Japanese girls go, girls go looking for white guys. But Th that's the Roppongi district. That is correct. Ah, okay. Because um, so, this is a famous district that everyone talks about. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is the place everyone talks about. But um, it's kind of funny. You can always tell people who learn the Japanese at Roppongi because they, um, you know, they 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 not, not that there's anything wrong with that sort of thing, but they sound uh, like they want to be women, you know, like <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, and it was kind of funny because a lot of the girlfriends deliberately don't fix it because otherwise they'll go, you know, it makes them less attractive <laughs> uh, to other people. Uh, so that was kind of a that was always kind of a funny thing. The other funny thing is in Japan, um, you know, there's so many dialects. Um, and uh, I, it, like, for example, from New Zealand, the government of New Zealand, when they were teaching us all Japanese and sending us to Japan to, to sell sheep and apples, um, they, they, they apparently New Zealand did some research and they realized that although Tokyo is the biggest city, um, the port of Kobe is connected equidistant from like uh, Kyoto and Osaka and like three or four massive cities that as a whole, actually, you can reach more Japanese consumers and there's a big port there where we'd import our stuff. So they said, don't send your shipments to Tokyo, send it to uh, Kobe because you can actually access more people in Kansai. So the result was as well, a lot of New Zealanders that I met who are fluent in Japanese speak the dialect of Osaka. They don't speak the standard Japanese, right? Um, which I always thought was a yeah, it's kind of funny. If you pick it up, and I'm, I'm sure it's the same if you have uh, people who pick up Chinese in Shanghai or whatever, and they go to Beijing, they'll be a little bit uh, people. It's kind of cool, but at the same time, people might not look at that the same way. Right. The The big thing about learning Mandarin Chinese, like Putonghua, yeah. is that yeah. Beijing has standardized the Mandarin right. language. And this yeah. uh, is part political, part cultural, part the, the unification of the Chinese people and nation in that oh, Mandarin Chinese is yeah. standard. There is no yeah. difference. So if you go north to south, east to west, it doesn't matter. It's going to be the same pronunciation. Now, within that, there are dialects, Shanghaiese, yeah. uh, uh, Cantonese. Uh, you mm. have the in, in Mongolia, Xinjiang, all these different places have their own dialects. And even uh, Dongbei, like northeast, uh, closer to, to Japan, they have their mm. own dialect. But the standard Mandarin Chinese mm. is what the government issues all of its proclamations in. So, mm. the and I saw, like, I think with Japanese, you, there is a system. Uh, there's like a, a government official Tokyo dialect that you learn if you're a student of Japanese, but yeah. you could pick and choose what you actually want to focus on. But when you, you when you choose to learn Mandarin Chinese, you're learning yeah. the government sanctioned Putonghua, which is what Beijing speaks, basically. No yeah. difference. Hey, hey. 
I'm sure it's the same in, in China. It's the same everywhere, actually. People take pride in their local accents, right? I'm sure it's the same in Canada. Um, but um, yeah, in, in Japan, it's true that um, uh, the uh, standard standard Japanese is what, what uh, if you go, if I go down to Osaka and say, I'm sorry, I only learned standard Japanese, um, they'll get really offended and say, <laughs> we, we, we were the capital first. Um, wow. But um, but yeah, um, standard Japanese is associated a little bit with the centralized, you know, the centralization of control in Japan as well that preceded World War II and whatnot, which um, people generally came to the conclusion was a bad thing. Um, and, and there's a little bit like uh, when you take regions of Japan um, that have a bit of local pride, they feel like if you say standard Japanese, that's like uh, that's like Tokyo suppressing and holding us down a little bit. I'm sure it's the same in other places. Uh, I think um, that's yeah. No, I I see that in Canada. Like uh, we have the indigenous yeah. peoples who are saying, you know, you forced us to learn English uh, in these reserve mm -hmm. systems, and basically our, our languages and cultures are dying as a result. I mean, I don't want to say it's the same thing happening in China. But something similar is happening when the government says, okay, there's Mandarin and then that's it. But I, I do see it though. For, for all of its faults, the idea of having a standard language, this is what Esperanto was supposed to be. Yeah, like it was right. supposed to be the language that everyone learned, that everyone can communicate. <laughs> Yeah. And look, in a country of what, 1.3 billion people, you need uh, common, you know, I mean, how, how, without getting into politics, I mean, how they can, how they manage to just administer, right? You know, yeah. a, a country as diverse and as big and with so many people, um, I'm, I'm sympathetic functionally to the idea of having a common, uh, at least a, a common, you know, intermediary language. So someone from Inner Mongolia can talk to someone from Southern China. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but I, but certainly I'm, I'm sure it's a thing there as well where people get sensitive when they feel like um, they're being encroached on. Um, uh, in yeah. Japan, you know, people take pride in, in, in their dialects, but it was also true that when those people come to Tokyo or when they're in a job interview or when they're on TV, except for Kansai, you're allowed, Kansai people will speak Kansai dialect on TV because it's kind of popular, like as a comedic um, dialect. But apart from that, everyone kind of suppresses their, their, their dialects. Uh -huh, okay. You know, so yeah. um, two things. Um, yeah. First, your your name, uh, but like huh. Hiko Simon. But then also, yes. you said you're in Japan for like 22 years. Uh, yeah. And the reason, like, those are sort of uh, uh, correlated questions, is because here in China, a lot of uh, my students, a lot of uh, the people I meet, are mm. basically say they love Japan. They love Japanese culture. Everyone loves mm. Japanese mm. culture. It sucks people in, and a yeah. lot of them. A few of them, it, it takes in and it brings them to the country and they stay there. Uh, yeah. So like, what, what got you into Japan, Japanese, and and your name, Hiko Simon, what, how you adopted that? Sure. Um, so on the first question, ironically and funnily, um, so my father was in the New Zealand army um, when I was a kid. And so we moved around a lot. And New Zealand used to have an army base in Singapore. Um, so I spent a lot of time as a kid living in Singapore, and I lived inside a Singaporean army camp, um, which was oh, wow. in the north of the island in a very um, traditional Chinese neighborhood called Nisun. So my school, I was going to a, a camp school, but, you know, New Zealand's not like the American military. We don't have whole cities built around the camps. You know, we actually live inside the Singaporean community. Um, and I'd go on a bus through Chinese neighborhoods to a little school that was for New Zealand kids. But I remember being surrounded by Chinese characters and this culture. I loved my time in Singapore so much that I, you know, when I, everything after that, I mean, imagine New Zealand, I'm sure, has a lot in common with Winnipeg, although not as cold. But when you live in country towns in Australia and New Zealand, and suddenly you go to a place like Singapore and you live there for two years, and then you go back to country towns in Winnipeg, you know, you kind of like, uh, you, you, you pine for the stimulation. Yeah. So... <laughs> So um, that was what it was like for me. So I had in my head ever since I went back to New Zealand after Singapore was I wanted to live in a place like Singapore again. And I wanted to learn Chinese. Um, and it was just funny because at the time that I was going through the school system, uh, Britain had just cut off Canada and New Zealand economically because they were going all in on the EU. So in New Zealand, we had to figure out where to sell our apples and our sheep. Right. And the government um, watched a couple of, um, you know, 1990s movies about J Japanese business taking over the world and said, okay, everybody, we're all learning Japanese now. And they started teaching all the kids Japanese. And I wanted to learn Chinese. 
Uh, and the, the irony is now they're teaching Chinese to everyone. Now they're convinced it's China. But back in the early 90s, just before the bubble burst, they said, yeah. okay, we're going all in on Japan. And I, I was caught up in that wave. So I, I, took China, I took Japanese partly because we were forced to. And I thought it would be cool because they have Chinese characters and maybe it's an indirect path to so eventually getting to Chinese. And it just happened that when I went on a school exchange to Japan, um, in high school, um, I, I was like, oh, well, maybe this place is pretty cool too. And I kind of switched paths just because I was on the Japan path. But it was actually out of interest in China specifically um, that I got on the Japanese train. Um, China would be that, happy to hear that. All the Chinese people <laughs> listening are like, see, see, that, there you yeah. go. <laughs> Although that was, to be clear, that was, that was, um, that was traditional Chinese. That was um, uh, Singapore, China, you know, um, so so different more like more like chinese taipei and places like that but um which is the expats yeah, the from the mainland china that fled all the other stuff that was going on at that time yes well, and they skipped out all the so they still have all the culture which isn't in mainland anymore as well which i which i must admit i liked um a lot but um yeah i was definitely attracted to that culture um but in terms of the name i i don't know if people do this in china i assume they must you know especially when you're new and you're learning the language and you think oh, i'd love to have a a local version of a name or i'd like to write my name in chinese correct characters and figure out a nice proxy so i just took my real name and i kind of picked out i picked out a car i used a couple of different variations of characters first like i wanted to have a, a, a chinese character signature right and um somebody suggested that it used to be that um um i mean I'll, 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 people have figured it out anyway quite often my, my name is simon um and it's funny because Simon in Japanese is a suffix that was used for like samurai names. So oh, okay. it, would never be on its own. it would never be a name on its own. Um, but there are a bunch of people like uh, Sir Galahad, you know, if you look at 16th century samurai names, half of them are names that they're really long names. Japanese people have long names compared to Chinese people. And they offered in with this three character, Nanta Zaiman, like as a suffix. Right. And the kind of one of those famous names is, a, is, is this famous like advisor to one of the shoguns called Hiko Simon. Hiko Simon. And it was like a commonly used name for kind of very smart, like, like Confucian scholars and stuff like that. So people said, you should use the characters that that guy used. For Simon, and whenever I explained it, I'd say I'm Simon, like Hiko Simon, and it kind of caught on. Where okay, I'll just I'll just call myself Hiko Simon. And the funny thing was, when I used it, everyone online started calling me Hiko, and I was oh, like, no, it's the other part. <laughs> but it kind of caught on, and I must admit, I kind of liked it. So, um, and you know, not, not people haven't registered it, so uh, that's that's how I got that. So, what does Hiko mean then? Um, it's just a name. I, I couldn't tell you what it means. I can I can write it, but it's uh, dude. <laughs> 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 uh, but, but, yeah, I, I, it, I, it's more, it's just, it, it's literally Galahad. I mean, what does Sir Galahad mean? Uh, you know, it, it, it's a 15th century samurai name. Uh, that's right. what I can sort of tell you. Um, ah, but, uh, wow. it, it's kind of cool. And it gave it's... me the characters. I, I, all that said, I don't write my name in kanji at all anymore, but um, just as an online moniker, it kind of stuck. Right. So then uh, when you're writing your name, you use a, a different name then. Uh, like Hiko um, Simon sort of like your your... You're basically yeah, person, personality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and you know, like, uh, again, when, when you're fresh off the boat, you know, I, I wanted to write my name in Japanese everywhere and yeah. have lots of interesting conversations. It gets a little bit tiresome though, like uh, at the bank every time when, you know, you want to impress them and you have a 10 minute conversation about it. And then at the end of it, they ask you to just write it in, in English, please. <laughs> um, and you know, you do that about for two years and eventually, yeah. you know, I've been here 22 years, you get a little bit tired. So you just get, uh, screw it. I'll just write it in English. So I kind of gave it up, but uh, that's where it originated from. So, okay. With that then with two years and mm -hmm. then you're like, okay, I got, I got to figure this out already. Would you say that that's very common for like a lot of foreigners who either in Japan or uh, China oh. sometimes, but like, well, I just, I need a Japanese name already. Well, I think if I'd come 10 years later, I would have been one of those people looking for a kanji tattoo or something like that. Terrible oh. idea. But, um, <laughs> you know, you know um, this, I think this is a, a more erasable um, and less life regretting uh, approach <laughs> to the same problem. You know, right. you're just excited and you want to, you know, to me, that was one of the things I'm learning. I'm trying to, I'm basically trying to be Japanese. As when I got here, I was going really deep with the language and sure, I'd like to get a cool, everyone's writing their name in kanji. Um, I'd like to get one for myself. Right. And I did that, but you know, it was just a gimmick. Um, there is a, there are, uh, it is funny though, you're talking about the first two years though. There are, are a lot of things, I don't know if this is the same for China or for you, but there are things 
there are a lot of things that as a foreigner, um, in Japan, it's funny, they call particularly Caucasian foreigners where we do get kind of special treatment, like a celebrity treatment in comparison to other people. Um, yes. But they, and they call us pandas, like especially when we when we're inside Japanese companies you know, in Japan. <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, okay, uh, it's kind of terrible. Uh, but and I guess it might not be the same in China because you have all the pandas. But like in Japan, when China wanted to be friends with Japan, they sent Japan a panda, and that panda was like the most popular thing in Japan for about yep. like two years. There was like panda mania about everything. You know, you'd people queue for days at the zoo to see the panda, and yep. there were like panda products and everything. Um, but, you know, Japan has these extreme booms and busts. And the kind of joke about the panda thing is, is that when a new foreigner joins the company, that you're the panda, you're like the, the flavor of the month. Yeah. But you stay there a little bit too long and the, the, the boom goes off and then they start, hey, can this guy actually do anything? <laughs> and then a new foreigner comes and they celebrate the new foreigner. So you have that. And, and so when you join and you kind of want everyone's extremely nice and excited that you're around when you join. But um, that kind of wears off. And... Oh, well, that's usually after crazy. six or seven months, though. I mean, because uh, yeah, I've lived in I mean, a few different right. countries, and it's like usually six or seven months. They're like, okay, that's right. yeah, that's awesome. Great, you're here. And then at that seven month, not only do does yeah. your luster wear off, but then your your admiration or your, uh, what do you call it, enamoring? Enamorance? Yeah. What's enamored? Yeah. Ena when you're enamored a, you're with yeah, that country, that culture, and you, you stop. And I remember when I was in South Korea, that was the first country mm -hmm. I lived in, um, that basically they said, you'll know what month numbers, month number seven, whether or not you will stay uh, another yeah. year. And at month seven, I'm like, I'm done. I got to go. But that w it wasn't because of South Korea. It was because of me. I want to keep on going. Yeah. And when I, when I lived in South Korea, I was exposed yeah. to that teaching English. I'm like, you mean... As a Canadian passport holder and a native native English speaker, I can live and work just about anywhere in the world. Yeah, I'm going. Like then, I yeah. was let off the chain. This this yeah. I was gone. I, there was no holding me back at that point. I'm like, if I could go anywhere, then I would just keep going until I couldn't go any further. So, yeah, oh, I get that. Um, but what was, uh, what was funny about when I first arrived and I was in that panda stage or whatever, and particularly in my first couple of companies, I was the only foreigner around and that was by my own choice as well. I wanted to be go deep. That's good. Um, but, but so there were things like in New Zealand, um, I'm sure Canada as well, you know, we have a ladies first culture. If you're both, if you're coming up to the door at the same time as a lady, you will typically stand back or maybe hold the door or whatever. And it's just, you get, have that beaten into you since you're a kid and you just yep. do it without thinking. So when you do it in Japan, it's kind of funny in Japan, if there's any difference around that at all, it'll generally be, particularly if there's like an older guy, um, everybody will let the guy go through, but certainly the women will. And generally women tend to be more differential. And when I'm in, a, when I was in a couple of old fashioned companies, so what would happen was I, on the first day, I go up to an elevator or go up to a door at the same time as a woman and they're expecting me to walk on through. Um, but I'm, I'm trained to let them walk on through. So we'd both stop and, <laughs> uh, and uh, she would say, oh, please go ahead. And I'd say, oh, no, no, you please, you go ahead. And they'll go, oh, you're a foreigner. You treat women really well. Isn't that wonderful? And I'd go, yeah, it is really wonderful. Aren't I great? And then they'll go in and then I'll go in and then she'll smile at me and it'll be, oh, aren't I wonderful? And, you know, and that'll happen three times a day. And, you know, over time. <laughs> that gets you know, really annoying. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, 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 do, you, have a, you have a tough week. You're doing a lot of overtime. You're kind of tired. You're late for a meeting. And you, you're walking up to an elevator and you know what's going to happen. You know <laughs> that you're about to lose another 10 seconds of your life. And it was kind of nice first. But I honestly, I'm tired and I can't deal with this. And yeah. they're not going to say anything if I just walk in. They expect me to do it. So at some point you just stop doing it <laughs> and you start becoming the old Japanese man who just walks, walks onto the elevator. Yep. And I must admit, there are, there are a lot of things like that that um, were kind of nice to do, but I just had to let go. But the funniest thing was, um, partway through my time in Japan, I went back to New Zealand to go and, go and get qualified as a lawyer. I went to a little training college for, you know, for my lawyer accreditation. And I realized how, far, how long I'd been away uh, because it was exactly the same situation in reverse back in New Zealand <laughs> where there was like a woman about to go to a door and a man was at the door and he was holding the door for her and I wasn't even looking. I just walked between both of them and walked through. <laughs> and the woman looked at me and said, at least someone around here is a gentleman. 
<laughs> I was like, oh my God, I can't live here anymore. <laughs> I'm done. You know, I'm living overseas has I'm destroyed ruined. me. Yeah. I I've get become a chauvinist. I get that the same with uh in terms of like who has the right of way. Uh and I have to be careful when I go back to uh, uh my hometown because my hometown only seven hundred thousand people. And you know, <laughs> there's a you can swing your arms wildly and not hit anybody going down the street or like down the sidewalk. In yeah. Beijing you're gonna hit someone eventually and They'd be like, why is this crazy foreigner flapping his arms all over the place? Yeah. But in Winnipeg, it's like when you come across someone else, you do oh. have to have a bit more leeway. You can't even get close to someone. Like if you walk within a foot of someone, oh, yeah. people are like, what the? Get what's back. We, hey, get, yeah, what, what's wrong with you? Are you assaulting me? Are you get away from me, you strange man? Whereas in China, it's like I've had people. I wrote a blog post about this years when you're walking and they will literally just walk right in front of you. It's gotten to the point where I try to kick their heels. And then mm. with that, it's like, it's kind of like one of those things. If you don't break face, nothing's wrong. So if you kick their, uh, their ankle and you're like, whatever, you keep walking, no one's any worse. But if they do notice, and if you ever do break face, you, oh. then you have to say, oh, and it's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But I'll put you down. I, even I though <laughs> you as a foreigner, you're going, I see you. And you as a human being must see me. There must be awareness of me as a people. I, I can't not exist. You know, and, and you saw that you were, we were going towards the same area. I, I've got a funny one for you. So I'm from uh, New Zealand and I've been in towns much smaller than that even. Although uh, I live longest, I went to university in Auckland and Auckland has a million people, but it's really spread out. To Auckland's actually one and a half times bigger than Tokyo in terms of land area. But wow. Tokyo, where, where Tokyo fits 30 million, Auckland fits 1.5 million. And it's got a business district that is like the size of one central train station <laughs> in Tokyo out of like dozens. <laughs> I mean, and, and Beijing is of course even bigger scale. I mean, the, the scale of Shanghai and Beijing, I've lived in Tokyo and, and they blow me away. So I, I know that we're both used to crowds. But one thing that got me, um, so I lived, when I was at university, um, the university campus of Auckland, uh, it's a horrible university in the sense that there isn't a nice campus. It's just a bunch of random buildings in the central city. Um, and uh, I had a part-time job at a Japanese souvenir shop also in the downtown. So I got an apartment like in the downtown where I could just walk to everything. Um, so the funny thing is, and this is embarrassing to say, the biggest city in New Zealand, and it has a million people, but it has one main street. There is a main street called Queen Street that you just walk on. It's like a kilometer long. And if at the bottom is where my part-time job is, and at the top of the hill, at the top of the street is where my university is. So I'd walk up and down the street, the main street of New Zealand, <laughs> you know, every day. And it's true. Maybe not flap your arms, but what, but what you would do is, because I worked in a souvenir shop with half of the Japanese population of Auckland, um, you know, it, it was selling stuff um, and knowing Japanese people from university and, and the fact that everyone going to university is getting off their buses on Queen Street and walking to the campus. And, yeah. you know, and I know a lot of people there. I could not walk from top to bottom of Queen Street without seeing somebody that I know. Yes. In a city of million people, it's impossible. So when you're in New Zealand, you basically cannot, and if you're in a city like Christchurch, the second biggest city, which has 600,000 people, um, you cannot walk down a street without just being aware of the crowd because you don't want to you don't want someone to think that you're ignoring them you don't want someone to see you and you miss them and think, they'll think that you're snobbing them or something so yep. basically what you do is you walk but you're always scanning the crowd because you're expecting to see someone that you know and especially and i, I would be tuned in that if i saw japanese people i'd check i'd double check because maybe i do really know them and i'll you know you say hello hey how's it going you know and I'll, I'll, I'll see people from my university hey how's it going and I, basically that walk would not be done in the busiest part of new zealand on the main street in the biggest city of new zealand i could not do that walk without bumping into someone that i know so when i got to tokyo i went to shibuya the biggest you know the big crazy intersection yep. and everything yeah, yeah. i remember the first couple of times i was there i would I, I got to shibuya and i walked for like 10 minutes and i was with my friends and i said I don't know why I'm, I'm sorry, but I need to sit down and I couldn't figure out why myself. And I sat down and I was completely, I'd walked only for 10 minutes through this crowded place. I couldn't figure out why am I completely drained and exhausted. And it took a minute to realize I was trying to scan the crowd. 
right. I was trying to scan every face in the crowd just automatically without realizing. And, you know, this is a place with like, um, you know, like Shinjuku station. When I went to Shinjuku, that's the busiest train station in the world. Like 5 million people go through this train station every day. And I was going through this train station trying to scan all 5 million faces. And I just had to sit down after 10 minutes of walking because I couldn't, my brain was just completely fried. Um, and I didn't, re- it took me a while, it took me a, a wee while to realize, oh, I'm doing that. I need to stop doing that. And this is the thing. I'm sure it's the same in, in Beijing. You need to just, you just, in the end, there's, there's so many people, you just, just have to switch going. off. You're just in a yeah. cone here. And <laughs> honestly, there could be uh, an alien or a walking crocodile. And I wouldn't even, I wouldn't know how I could be pressed against them on the train. Uh, yeah. You know, Someone but, would have to like just take a picture with the camera, post it on the news feed. And you'd be like, oh, there's a ca- Oh, that's right here. Oh, there's a me. crocodile in the photo. Hey, hey, look at me, mom. <laughs> yeah, there's a crocodile on the yeah. subway. Why is that doing it? I shouldn't be near but that. But that need to switch off in crowds, that's something I had to learn after coming here, and I had to learn it because it was so exhausting, and I, I couldn't figure out why I was so tired all the time. So, yeah, that, that Now was that fun, you that mention was... it, I, I, I do remember uh, one of, like, just ever moving away from Winnipeg was that there is that face mm. scanning where you're always looking, and it's always <laughs> made me wonder how another foreigner can miss me in Beijing. And that's when I think I'm getting snubbed. Uh, that Because yeah. whenever I see someone like a white face or a black face, I'm like, oh, foreigner, do I? That's when I scan. Yeah. I'm like, do I know this person, yeah. right? Because uh, who knows? And then maybe there's like that, you know, that common nod. You're like, hey, it has gone. Even if we don't even know each other, it has gone. Uh, but then like if it's Chinese people, I mean, they just all blend in. And that's, it's not just because of the faces. It's just because you have to ignore everything yeah, you process yeah it's just it's yeah. impossible and that's always it makes me wonder why foreigners would not know that i'm walking right beside them i have to be the one that says hey how's it going who knows maybe i'm just a forgettable person that, that makes me <laughs> sad a little bit <laughs> the only thing that's really changed with tokyo is certainly when i first got here around 2000 you know in the late 90s um, we did stick out like sore thumbs and we were rare, even in Tokyo, um, you know, well, in Tokyo, outside of Tokyo, people might be surprised if you can use chopsticks or, you know, they yeah. will tell you the first foreigner, but, but in Tokyo, it wasn't at that level, but, but you would notice and certainly you, we would stand out a lot. But, but the thing was, Tokyo used to be so, or Japan used to be so, um, I, I went backpacking around Japan uh, when I was in university. And I remember it was just laughable. It was great for learning Japanese because you needed to use it because there was just no, there was a lot of domestic tourism infrastructure, but there was no international tourism infrastructure anywhere. So I'd go to an information center and there would be no English information. The, 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 tour, the tourist information person normally couldn't speak anything but Japanese. Yeah. And they wouldn't even tell me where hotels that they could use, that, that I could use um, that were not on their approved list that they were getting kickbacks from and stuff like that. So when the prime minister announced in 2002, Koizumi, when he said, um, uh, at that time, Japan had like a hundred thousand tourists per year. Um, and they said, we're going to change that. <laughs> wow. You know, <laughs> and they said, we're going to boost that number to 10 million in 10 years. And I was like, wow, you have no idea what you're talking about. You know, you guys are so far from having any clue where to start on that. Like, it's kind of what was fun about Japan. It was a safe, but awkward place to go around. You know, you, you, you'd bump into things, but it was that, it was the difficulty you were never in danger. You, you're never going to yeah. go down the wrong street in Japan. You know, so you'd muddle through. That was what was fun about Japan, is that you were like on an alien planet, but where you're not going to get mugged. <laughs> yep. Um, but, but like, yeah, screw me. The Japan pulled it off a lot, like crazy. I mean, I thought it was a joke when they said that they were going to boost tourism. But before pre-COVID, we had like 30 million tourists last year. Uh, and the foreign population in Japan went from like 300,000 in the whole of the country when I got here to more than 2 million now. So there were like now seven times more foreigners than there were when I when I got here. Um, yeah. So that's the other thing now. Now it really is increasingly co- common in Tokyo anyway. Like we're increasingly normal. It's still you know of course you get into the countryside. Of course it still is going to be a little bit different, and you'll get the panda treatment. But yeah, new arrivals in Tokyo don't get the panda treatment that I got anymore. No, which is probably for the best. But yeah. yeah. I uh, I came across an old tweet or a Facebook uh, post from my time. I was in. Uh, Japan back in 2016 for two weeks, mm-hmm. and the what there was two things I, I noticed the major differences between Japan, like Tokyo and, and Beijing and, and China, was that number one, t- Japan is so clean you can't even throw out your garbage. Uh, mm-hmm. Number two was in China it's hey everyone spot the foreigner, 
in Japan, it's, hey, everyone, spot the Japanese person. Because there are none. I mean, like, there's just so few that you're like, hey, there's a Japanese person, and then there's foreigner, 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 Japanese person, foreigner, 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 foreigner. But I mean, I mean, I was in the most, the, the, uh, the uh, tourist yeah. districts and whatnot. So, I mean, I was in like a, a Saksa, or as I called it, Asakusa. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> then that would make sense. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and for me as well, that, that like, yeah, when I, I've only been to Asakusa a couple of times, but when I first went there, there were maybe a couple of Chinese tours and stuff like that, but there were not really noticeable foreigners, certainly in the early days. And now you go there and it is just, just you know, wall to wall foreigners. Packed. So, Packed. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just amazing how when they focused on doing that well and they just plugged away at it, they, they, they pulled it off. But uh, I never thought they were capable of it. So, yeah. Um, for me, what I found, one thing I found really interesting, um, I haven't been to Beijing. I've been to Shanghai, Dalian, and Hong, Hong Kong. I mean, mm -hmm. Hong Kong being a special. But I think about Hong Kong. Hong Kong, I, I, I thought, is clean and modern and has this, you know, I thought beautiful it's a city. Like Japan, but, but I found the subway system. One thing I liked about Hong Kong was, and it's something, you know, you don't, you don't notice some, some things sometimes until they're absent. Um, in Japan, even when you're in a crowded trains, and even though there's the, the trains are silent, nobody talks, you don't talk to your friends on trains because you don't want to annoy other people. <laughs> um, but what's funny is everybody kind of is aware of everybody else. Like they won't look directly at people, but, but there's this huge social conformity. If someone's being noisy, right. for example, or somebody's putting makeup on on the train, everyone's looking out the side of their eyes, but they're giving evil eyes, you know, right. and, and it's kind of, so when you get the drunk, you know, American army guys or the tourists or whatever, obnoxious tourists coming on the train, they probably don't even notice, but I'm standing there and I know what's going on and I'm looking at everybody <laughs> going like this and I'm thinking, oh shit, I don't want to be like that. And it's kind of, you know, there's this kind of like social, like uh, there, there's the Japanese are hugely aware. There's this huge sort of social awareness of what's going on. And when I went to Hong Kong and I was in the same situation on the train where you've got loud people on their cell phones talking and kids running up and down and stuff like that, I really noticed nobody is paying attention to anybody. Like it's crowded and it looks the same, but I realized the eyes on everybody and the, the judgment, the judgmental eyes on everybody out the side, but not talking or confronting that you have in Japan everywhere that you just become used to. Um, to me, it felt like, wow, you know, Hong Kong really, and I think this is what you hear about Chinese culture that, People, it's, it's ironic. China is the, the socialist country that is very individualistic and Japan is the capitalist country that actually is extremely culturally socialist. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when I was in Hong Kong, I was like, wow, people here do not give a shit about like what other people are doing where you really feel the pressure of that all the time. So I felt this huge sort of lifting of this kind of uh, stress a little bit in Hong Kong in comparison that was really interesting. Yeah, if you ever came to Beijing, especially now with the the crowds, I, I I agree that when you walk onto that subway, people don't know if you are there. Like they they're like, "Hey, I'm bumping into something. Is that the pole? Oh, it's a person. Oh, okay, I should probably shift over." You know, and like and that. Yeah. And Japan has packed subways during rush hour as well, uh, but like so, even outside so, yeah. of it, right? That's a good point. So you're right. People will ignore everyone around and they'll crush and whatever. And everyone will kind of be passive and be neutral unless someone is doing something wrong. <laughs> and if someone is doing something wrong, everybody notices. You know, it'll be rare for someone to confront someone about it. But for example, yeah. if someone's talking on a mobile phone on a train, um, when there are when there are posters saying do not talk on mobile phones on trains, if somebody in the crush picks up a mobile phone, um, normally they will audibly say, I'm very sorry. I can't talk to you because I'm on a train. I have to hang up now. And then everyone will be mm, talking, but okay, apologizing. But if someone's carrying on the conversation, the looks that go, and that's actually, it's actually not unlike New Zealand, the, um, the social pressure and the social judging. But, um, you know, if you are sitting with your legs apart or you're opening a wide newspaper or you're talking on the phone or doing stuff that's not socially um, allowed, acceptable, you know, yeah. Even, even in those crushes, so long as you're just being passive and silent and not breaking any rules, it's, you're not there. Yeah. But the moment you do something, like you talk loudly or yeah, yeah, boom. So yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. And I've become so used to it. This is the thing. So now it really jars me when it's not there. Yeah, it, you, you um, become dead into it. It's just like, yeah, someone. The thing with, uh, with China and talking on the phone, I don't know if Japanese people talk quietly on the phone, but the Chinese, and I think South Korea had this too. It was the escalating cell phone conversation. It was the, yeah. it would start soft and then it just got louder 
and louder and louder. And it's just to the yeah. point, it's like, you know, there's two things you can do here, sir or med- ma'am. I call them back. Or two, hmm. you realize that your first voice that you used, if they heard that, you could use the same type of voice. You don't need to go any louder. Uh, is it the yeah. same thing in Japan? No. <laughs> uh, no. So so the thing is, and this is where as a New Zealander, I kind of feel uh, com- uh, the way in which I feel comfortable with Japanese people is that Japanese, like New Zealanders, are very self-conscious. <laughs> right. um, they are mindful of how they appear to other people um, okay. and not wanting to appear obnoxious. Um, whereas... And I must admit, this is what I like about going to Australia. People don't care how they look. Uh, and when I go to Hong Kong, it was the same thing. When I saw that person talking obnoxiously loudly on the phone, no doubt about some offshore you know, investment he was making or something, um, I'm like, wow, people here do not give a shit. I love this. You know, mm-hmm. like it, it was liberating because from New Zealand and Japan, I'm, I'm just used to it. And this is it. Japanese will be. And someone in Japan, it's not like they're, they, they exist. There might be some obnoxious person or some young person who doesn't know the rules yet um but the 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 societal hazing that you'll be subject to for being that loud person on the phone um and sooner or later some old guy's going to slap you or do something and you know straighten you out yeah so um, we are uh, running out of time because i know you got to get going um if i could ask you one other question because we're talking about this uh in terms of like the expression and being able to express so when people go to your youtube site one of the first Mm -hmm. videos that they encounter is uh ferals uh clap clap your hands if if you're happy right be happy happy. right uh (laughs) so there are two scenes that you got a bunch of foreigners uh, or non-Chinese people, or some Chinese, uh, sorry, Japanese people that were in the video, but primarily yeah. a lot of uh, foreign people living in Japan, I imagine. Um, yeah. And there was two that stuck out uh, the most to me. Mm-hmm. There was the guy in, I guess it was the, I don't know if they were red underwear or if they were red pants, uh, red red yes. shorts. Yes. With the, uh, yeah. he had glasses and a bunny hat. So that was the first one. Yeah. And then the other one that was, he didn't, he played a couple, a, a few shots in that in that role in that that yeah. video. But then the other guy happens towards the end of the video. There's a man in a green suit, and, a neon yes. green suit, and two, I guess it's girls in bunny costumes that are doing this little bunny hop. Now, yeah. in terms of expression, first of all, who were those people? Second of all, not that yeah. you need to out them, but uh, but second of all, like, do you see that Japan has always had that sort of ability to express itself and? And you've lived there for a while. You don't see that in China. Like you would not see foreigners dressing up in bunny costumes. I know a few people who might, but it wouldn't be in terms of any sort of artistic expression uh, as you were doing. So what do you see in that sort of uh, expression of foreign culture? So first of all, that video is basically a compilation of people who either are themselves YouTubers based in Japan uh, in the international community, or actually just people who watch my channel, who I said, hey, send me a five minute, five second clip of dancing to this track and I'll edit it together into a montage and we can all see ourselves. It'll be fun. And it got a great response and it, the video came out wonderful. Um, the the person in the, the 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 costume with the underwear and so on that was a guy called a, a kind of a, a character called Mr Jones and okay. he was an Australian guy who was both as a as a kind of personal goal and as a subject of a documentary he was an Australian who came out to Japan in order to see if he could make it big if he could uh, get it, land a job work getting you know, getting featured on Japanese TV by sort of being a, a, an outrageous foreigner. So he was sort of doing this for more than a year, but he also had his friends were like recording the whole like journey as a documentary and it got released as a feature film. Wow. Um, and I met him up w- w- with the release of that film. In fact, that was before that. So I guess we were technically part of his journey, but so he was trying to boost his online presence uh, <laughs> as part of this sort of social experiment that he was making of himself. So that was actually, so that, that, that person is super interesting and the movie about his thing is really interesting. What's the movie called? Um, do you know? Uh, do you know it offhand? Do you know, I know his character name was Mr. Jones. I can dig it. I'll share the link and sure. you can put it in the description. It, yeah. Because I think you can actually watch it on Vimeo. I'm not sure now, but yeah, um, it's good. It's good. Um, the other thing is, um, yeah, and he has, and the documentary is it's his own journey, but he also interviews other foreigners. Who have, uh, it's called Big in Japan. Okay. Big, uh, that's his title, Big in Japan, and he actually. Uh, while doing his own journey, he get, he features three other famous foreigners and he actually interviews them about their journeys 
and how they became big in Japan while he's trying to make it himself and he's trying to get advice from them. And it's, it's a well done documentary. It's highly, it's actually, I'm sure would be interesting to your audience actually just for the, with the Japan twist. Um, the other people in the bunny costume, I think I know who you mean. And honestly, I don't know who they are. I think they were just people, oh, they well, I say just people. They, they were people who, who were nice enough to watch my own videos and submitted a, a clip. Um, so I couldn't tell you anything about them um, other than uh, they're awesome for contributing a clip. <laughs> um, there is a culture, I don't know if you have this in China, but there is a culture which kind of divides the foreign community a little bit about um, the, the gaijin smash, the idea that if you're a foreigner, you can act a little bit more rowdy and obnoxious than a local. Um, it's think, true. Yeah. But uh, even then, the government sort of has been cracking down on like public behavior uh, in the yeah. last year or two years. And, and the same here. Like there's a thing in Japan around Halloween that there's like a, a bunch of foreigners that would be fun to get drunk on the, the circular train around Tokyo and having a party on the train and being noisy and so on. And it really breaks all of the social rules and it really annoys a lot of the, the people who ride the trains and it started to get national media attention and the police started like uh, standing on the trains here as well and trying to discourage it. So, yeah. uh, and this is the other thing in, in, in your profession, you know, there are short term people who are traveling the world often uh, to, to drink and party as much as possible and do it, you know, on, on a budget speaking English and, 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 and not caring. Yep. about the consequences because they're going to go home and there are people who are really trying to establish a life in the countries and they're really um you know they they hate it when someone else makes it more difficult for them by being dicks and you know yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, don't yeah, be a you know, dick have, you just don't don't do it <laughs> that's the P psa message uh, yeah it makes it like like you know, landlords will 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 stop renting out to foreigners when they have bad experiences with foreigners and they're foreigners who who don't give a crap about anyone else and they're tossing garbage off the balcony and they're being obnoxious and and they ruin it for the for the people who come after um so there is a there is a thing there is a thing generally where there are foreigners who go a little bit crazy with the partying thing and um you know, it can be fun but it can go a little bit too far but the the thing about japan generally is that that i think you're also getting at is that while Japan is very conformist and there are all these social rules and these behavior rules, it is kind of funny that Japanese in their own way, one thing I like about Japan is that um, in New Zealand, people are so self-aware and conscious of what other people are thinking that people are kind of like you become, you don't want to show off too much, but you also don't want to be too cheesy or corny. Like people are really aware of how they're being seen. And so right. there's this kind of, it's not, you know, you're trying to strike this balance of not being a poser, but at the same time, not being a dork. Yeah. And it's kind of like, like you, so even if you like a cheesy music tune or you like a bright fashion or something like that, you can't really do it in New Zealand because you'd be worried about how your friends will react. There is a nice thing about Japan that I really like, which is that um, Japanese people will really openly like be into heavy metal, but they'll go and buy a CD of a children's album that's really popular. And, you know, they'll go to a, like, they won't be, they won't be so self-aware that they won't allow themselves to enjoy stuff that's just good or fun. And I really like that about Japan. And yeah, Japanese are great when it comes to parties. I've been at the music festivals and everything here. The oh, fact that, you know, in New Zealand, Yeah, well, you know, in New Zealand or Australia, the pe half the people will be on drugs, there'll be fights, there'll be, if, if you get too many drunk people in a space, you know, it kind of gets nasty. Yeah. In Japan, you know, you, you're in a park on Hanami season uh, everyone is drunk, 100,000 people drunk in a pot. You need the army to control that in New Zealand. Um, everyone is just having a good time. And, you know, people will dance, people will wear a silly costume and everyone is like, isn't that great? There are no police, there's no trouble. Um, and the only people who cool. are fighting are the foreigners. <laughs> yeah, quite often. Uh, you know, of course, of course, there are Japanese people who do that, but but by and large, you know, it's yeah, like, um, but it's, not as much. It's, uh, just people being cool. So, you know, I, I like that. I like the uh, lack of um, self-consciousness about those kind of things. Like it's okay to be a bit of a dork. Um, and, and I guess the reason is, is that in Japan, everything is in clicks, but there's just so many people. And in Tokyo, it's such a big city that if you're in the wearing purple, you know, uh, if you're in the purple uh, uh, wig and, and dresses uh, click, you know, you can find uh, 10 other people in the same interest group in a certain train station and go hang out with them and it's all cool. And people generally, so long as you're in a group and you're, and you're being considerate about how you go about it, yes. you can go down and go. Yep. So you can find a place. This is, I think for when you come from a place like Canada or New Zealand where it's a low population, yeah, just to be in a place full of people and where there are all these niches and all these cliques, you know, and, and people can, they can express themselves a bit more. And that's kind of nice. I mean, it's, it's regulated, but at the same time, there's no, 
Um, there's social regulation of how you express yourself, but you can find a safe place for pretty much any type of expression. And I think that's what's really interesting about Japan. That's why so much great culture comes out of here. I think that's why a lot of people love the Japanese culture and want to go to Japan. They, they, they love their experience there for sure. So, And China, by the way, as well. I mean, uh, it's... Uh, Apart from the fact that it's obviously in spite of politics right now, which is stupid, but you know, it's clearly where everything's going and, and the way that China's come up. Um, and, and by the way, also nothing makes me happier um, than um, I, one of my last jobs involved uh, managing a team based in Dalia and going back and forth. And Dalian is sort of the city within China that's the most Japan friendly. I like um, Dalian. Uh, Dalian's a nice city. I know people who live there and they're all like, it's a, just a better city. <laughs> it's a nice place. Um, but also the people there, uh, you know, it's got a really interesting history. And that's where if you want to learn Japanese in China, you should go to Dalian because they've got the best Japanese language courses in China and Japanese outsourcing centers are all based up there. Right. Um, but yeah, it's kind of funny. I was always like, uh, is it okay to ask if you like Japan? Like, is that sensitive? Because I know lots of people who don't like Japan, like from Korea and from uh, Hong Kong, and people will say that they don't like Japan. And I know it gets sensitive, but it's really, nothing makes me happier than to see them getting along. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think there's so much in common in Japan. So it has so much linkages with Chinese culture historically. So yeah. I, uh, with that, like in terms of like, uh, d d do people like Japan, you hear it from the older generation that might be a little bit more suspect because they mm -hmm. lived through and they heard it from their grandparents. And you hear like totally a lot of the, as the United States makes World mm -hmm. War II, uh, like war movies about like terrorists who are always unnamed brown people with beards, um, or they're like Chinese or the Germans. China makes war movies against Japanese. Like that is their yeah. go-to war movie. So it kind of fosters it at, at, at some point, a, a little bit. But at the same time, the younger groups, like all, all the university kids are like, no, I love Japan. Manga, I love manga. I want to learn Japanese. They're like English, I do because I have to. Japanese, I do because I love to. It's just that mm. enamoring, uh, enamorment with that, that culture and the, the, their output. So uh, I, don't, I don't see the same aggressiveness uh, f uh, in the, uh, the younger group uh, at all. So Yeah, I'm really glad to see that. All right, it's yeah. uh, getting late here. You got to get going because you want to go to bed and it's getting close to my bedtime as well. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, where can they find you? <laughs> uh, I'm everywhere. As, uh, basically, YouTube or Twitter are the best places. And I'm the same moniker everywhere, Hiko Simon. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, if you want to actually contact me, uh, Twitter uh, message is the best way, but um, I, 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 I post stuff there all the time. But if you want to check out my stuff, talking about what's going on in Japan every week, I'm on YouTube. I live stream every Sunday night and, and the recordings stay up. So you can, you can see those if you're interested, but um, yeah, you know, um, and thanks for reaching out. It's great to connect. And I actually, yeah, I, I love these kind of conversations. I'm always, I, I deliberately do not talk about China on my, or, or, or one, I, I want to keep it Japan focused and two, I don't want to say anything that, you know, is uninformed and, you know, um, upsets people uh, i'm happy to upset people talking about japan but i don't want to i don't want to say thing talking about other countries so i am interested in china and i follow it but you know it's great to talk with someone who's there and to have a conversation like this it's, it's really fun to share this compare notes so yeah, yeah no, thanks it, for having me it was great and i thought like uh, when i when i reached out last week and i was thinking you know it'd be great to have sort of the the a conversation about the different i, I the, the, uh, across the pond, basically, you know, you got Japan over yeah. right here and you got China right over here. And it's like, what is it? Two experiences of people living so close to each other, but very mm. far apart in terms of very like different places, culture yeah. and uh, goings on and whatnot. Uh, China and the company I work for would not like me talking about the politics, but the language, the culture, everything else is pretty much uh, fair game. Uh, the, the netizens of the world, the Chinese netizens might take issue with some of the things that uh, have been said or are said or thought, but I think it's a good conversation to have uh, in terms of opening up and, you know, bridging that gap between the people who see China in the news and then like yeah. what China is. Well that's, well, that's it. And this is when I was over in Dalian as well, the Chinese people, they were at pains to um, inappropriate settings. Um, let me know. 
oh yeah, we talk politics and we have views and don't think that, you know, all that stupid crap you see in the news is actually what we think here. And, you know, um, they, 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 it, was, it was nice that people, I wasn't asking for it at all. I, I, I was deliberately being safe. And I think they detected that. And they actually, um, when we were in a closed room at a hot pot, they sort of said, don't worry, dude, <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> um, so that was kind of nice, but I'll, I'll tell you what as well. If you ever, if you ever want to have another conversation and you want me to talk about Japan politics, the great thing about Japan is there is no, there's nothing like that. So, um, you know, I mean, there are, there are net nationalists and whatever, like there are in every country in Asia. But um, yeah, uh, 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 that that is my shtick. That is what I do every week, and that is what I tweet about. So um, I'm always happy to talk about that. But uh, yeah, yeah, no, thanks for I appreciate the chat. It's uh, it's nice to connect. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, for joining me today. So, uh, that, okay, so that's Hiko Simon. Uh, you can find him on Twitter and on YouTube as well. Uh, and I'll post all this on the show notes on my website as well. Thank you very much, sir. Have a good night. We'll talk again. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Bye-bye. All right. So that was uh, episode 15 of uh, my podcast, the Stephen Searching Podcast. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed that uh, that chit chat with Hiko, uh, and we'll have him on again. I'll have him on again uh, in the future. We'll probably talk a, a bit more. I thought it was a great conversation uh, talking about language acquisition and culture, some of the different culture things, and I'm sure uh, it was informative um, to everybody. I mean, you probably don't hear conversations like that, but I will tell you that those are the types of conversations that happen in expat bars, usually when you're sober, uh, at the beginning of the night, around the world. And these are some of the things that when you return to wherever you come from, it's hard to explain when someone says, say, hey, how was China? How was Japan? Well, it's conversations like that, um, that are very eye-opening and very personally eye-opening. So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you got something out of it. Thank you again for joining me. We'll talk again. Have a great one. Bye-bye.